Hello, I'm Venki Ramakrishnan. I'm a scientist at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, which is just a couple of miles south of here. Uh, it's also called the LMB. And I'm here today to speak about migration and science. Now, of course, I'm a scientist, not a historian. Uh, so I'd just like to, in this lecture, give you my take on why science is such an international and global endeavor and has depended on people moving uh, from one part of the world to another. And uh, that is a way that ideas get exchanged and new ideas develop. And I'll end a little by telling you a little bit about my own migration uh, in science. So I hope you enjoy the talk. Good evening and welcome to the seventh of this 2018 Darwin College Lecture Series on Migration. And thank you all very much for turning out in this pretty unpleasant evening. So far in this, in this series, we've considered migration as a, consequences, as a consequence of war or famine or, or dis disaster, and m people migrating to secure a better life. And also the roles of migration in human infectious diseases. So thinking about this university, Cambridge was founded by migrating scholars. Many of us today are migrants. If we thought about uh, academics as, as migrating birds, some don't migrate, perhaps. Um, others right, migrate long distances, you know, be we swallows or storks, sometimes migrating many times in a career. At the start, it was refugees from uh, unrest in Oxford or Paris that founded this university. Then later, there's Erasmus. And Milton wrote that it was not for nothing that the grave and frugal Transylvanians set out yearly, sent, sorry, sent out yearly, not their youth, but their staid men to learn our language and our arts. And today, obviously, a great deal of the strength that Cambridge has has come from migrant scholars who have been tempted to move here. Now, the, the dangers are not as great, but I wonder whether there is a fundamental difference between the pull of hope that leads a postdoc to migrate and the pull that draws citizens of poor countries to undertake perilous journeys across deserts or oceans. Obviously, the attractor is key. For a postdoc, it's the facilities or the people to work with. For others, just getting a better or a safer job. Scientists generally expect to move, and clearly email and the internet these days make collaboration very easy. But we still need labs, we need equipment, we need skills that aren't necessarily easily learned except by being with someone or in a community and learning from them. And then there are the jobs. And clearly Cambridge uh, has a great deal to offer. Today, scientists are very much part of networked international communities and we publish openly and we try to make findings available to, to everyone. So, you know, this is different now from what life was like uh, for the early scholars in this university over 800 years ago. But tonight, to speak to us about how scientific development has resulted from the mobility of, of peoples, we have the president of the Royal Society. So please welcome Sir Venki Ramakrishnan from the MRC uh, LMB lab. And he's going to speak, as you can see, on migration in science. So thank you. Welcome. <laughs> 
Thank you all for coming. Uh, I have to say, if I had the choice, I probably wouldn't come to listen to me on a day like this. But um, the other thing I should say is I'm not a historian. And so what I've done is put together some, what I hope you'll find are interesting anecdotes about how scientists, you know, certain scientists migrated and what that meant to them or uh, to their uh, careers. So the first thing I should say is I came to England uh, almost 19 years ago and uh, I came to work at the LMB, which is just a couple of miles south of here, a, a very famous lab that was founded by these people. Actually, it was the, the, the driving force behind it was Max Perutz, who's this gentleman here, who was himself uh, an immigrant. And uh, <laughs> the first three directors of the LMB uh, were all immigrants uh, to England. So Max Perutz was the first, and then there was Sidney Brenner, and then Aaron Klug. And uh, uh, those of you who are at Darwin College should know Richard Henderson very well, and Hugh Pell. And uh, the new director, also a fellow of Darwin, Jan Merve, um, is also an immigrant. So four of the first six uh, directors, or four of the six directors we've had since its inception uh, were immigrants to this country. Now, there is a large foyer in the new LMB building, and as I uh, walk past the foyer to go up the stairs to my lab, I have to pass this little poster uh, in the middle of the foyer. And this is a picture of the Nobel laureates of the LMB. So you can see the lab has been incredibly successful. There have been 16 Nobel laureates, but there are actually only 15 people because this fellow, Fred Sanger, is represented twice. He's one of the few people to have won two uh, Nobel Prizes. But um, when you look at these people, what you realize is that well over half of them were immigrants uh, to England. And in fact, the most recent Nobel laureate is a sort of immigrant. He came from Scotland. <laughs> and you know, uh, you may remember Alexander Fleming's mother telling him that if he who stayed in Glasgow, he would have to compete with Scots, so he was better off going to England where he would only have to compete with the English. So that's Richard Henderson for you. Anyway, it, it just shows you uh, that, you know, the, the, the world today where uh, scientists come from all over the world uh, to work in sort of the big centers of science and, and make their contribution. Uh, moving to a sort of more national level, uh, here are the last few presidents of the Royal Society, and you can see three of the last five uh, were also immigrants to this country, and a sixth was actually a son of immigrants. So Michael Atiyah's father, uh, I believe Edward Atiyah, came from uh, Lebanon. So the question is, has migration mattered in the past? Clearly, today's science uh, is, is very international in its look. So I wanted to talk about uh, just one particular uh, mi migration that happened. And to think about that, I want you to multiply these two numbers, okay? And what you'll see is that it's almost impossible to do, okay? Because uh, that, that is, those are the numbers that existed in Europe for um, almost a millennium. And actually, the same numbers, if you convert it to what we call Arabic numerals, is something that any school child uh, can do, elementary school child can do. And the question is, how did we adopt these numbers? And the, the beauty of these numbers is, unlike the Roman notation, uh, each number has a, a, a quantity, but it also has a place value. So you have, you know, units, tens, and hundreds, and so on. The other interesting thing is that it has this number zero, which signifies nothing as a, as a placeholder. And these two came about um, 
in India uh, a couple of thousand years ago. And there is currently uh, an exhibition at the Science Museum which is celebrating 5,000 years of science and innovation in India. And one of the most precious uh, items on display is what's called the Bakshali Manuscript, which was, dates back to about 220 to 380 AD. And it's about 70 leaves of birch bark. And it's currently part of the Bodleian Library. The manuscript itself is written in Sanskrit and it's a compilation of mathematical rules in verse with prose commentary. So the actual rules are in verse and uh, the sort of description of the rules uh, is in prose. And they're rules of, they're sort of algorithms for a variety of problems, including linear, linear equations, quadratic equations, uh, arithmetic series, and so on. And here's a picture of the manuscript itself, and you can see all these writings, and if you look closely, you'll see these dots. And what these dots are, are actually the first existing, still existing representation of zero. Okay, so it's the oldest document that we have, which has the number zero in it. And these are the numbers that uh, are, are represented in the manuscript, and you can see that they have you know, symbols for the ten digits. Now, the way that the concept of positional notation spread was partly because of the Islamic conquest. So, uh, this shows the different waves of the Islamic con conquest. It started off in Saudi Arabia and then uh, there was an Islamic conquest to these orange countries and then expanded further to these yellow countries, thereby connecting um, India, parts of India, all the way to Spain and indeed uh, to southern France. And during that migration of ideas from India through the Arabs into Europe, the idea of positional notations and numbers was carried across. But of course the numbers didn't retain their form and what this figure shows is how the, the actual symbols representing the digits themselves changed. And I can tell you this Sanskrit uh, notation which is also used in Hindi is still wi it's, it's widely used in many North Indian languages. So for example when I, uh, where I grew up in uh, Gujarat, uh, this is actually what you would see in signs in, in, in markets and so on. And then um, you, you can see how it further mutated until uh, in the 16th century you, you have something that's very close to the numbers that we recognize today. Now, of course, it wasn't just numbers, the, but the ease with which you could manipulate numbers meant it also advanced mathematics. And two things that we sort of take for granted, algorithm and algebra, you can, you can almost tell just from the al prefix that they're Arabic in origin. And the word algorithm is named after Al-Khwarizmi, who was a, actually a Persian, but he wrote in Arabic, and his book was translated into uh, Latin. And he, his textbook is what introduced uh, positional notation to the Western world. And of course, algebra in some form or the other had always existed, but it was advanced a great deal by the Arabs. And in fact, the word algebra comes from the Arabic al-Jabr, which means the reunion of broken parts. So the Arabs made tremendous advances in mathematics at a time when, uh, during medieval uh, period in Europe, it was really the Arabs in Spain uh, and other parts who were sort of advancing mathematics and, and the sciences. Now, along with uh, mathematics and the sciences, they also um, advanced the science of cryptography. And the point is that cryptography was considered a solved problem for almost a thousand years. 
because no one figured out how to break a, what's called a substitution cipher, where you simply substitute one letter of the alphabet by some other unrelated letter. And you might think you could do that by writing down all the letters of the alphabet and then writing random substitutions as a code, but then you'd have to remember it. And you couldn't remember the whole combination, so then you'd write it on a piece of paper, and that, of course, would be very dangerous because if you're caught, people would catch you with a piece of paper. And so what people would, did was invent the idea of key phrases. So, for example, if you have a phrase called Darwin Lecture, what you would do is you would remove the space and any repeated letters. For example, R is repeated and E is repeated and so on. So what you would then get is a key phrase, which is which is this Darwin Lect 2, okay? And then what you would do is you would put that key phrase underneath the alphabet, and then at the end of the key phrase, you would start off with the next letter and keep going uh, with all the letters that hadn't been used in the key phrase. So you'd just fill up the rest in order. So when you get to Z, you'd go back to A, but of course A is part of the key phrase as in Darwin, and so you'd actually get B and so on. And so this kind of substitution, so you could easily remember the key phrase, and so this kind of substitution cipher uh, was considered uncrackable. Now, what, now, the thing of course was, letters are not completely random. Now, my wife and I uh, like to play Scrabble uh, periodically, and what you can see is that Scrabble has a particular distribution of letters. There are far more E's and then A's and then I's and so on. And of course, there's only one of Q or Z. Now, how did this distribution come about? Well, the person who invented Scrabble just took a newspaper article and counted the number of times a particular letter would occur and then uh, assigned that fraction uh, to 100 tiles. So it calculated a percentage and rounded it off. And so E showed up at 12% of, of the letters in the article that this person read. And of course, if it was zero, they would just still put one a tile like Q or Z. Now, what the Arabs had realized is you could take a completely unknown encoded text and you could simply count how often each character appeared. And depending on the language, different letters will have higher frequency. And so they could figure out, oh, if, it, if it's an English text, you would say, well, the most frequent letter is most likely to be an E, and if not, it's most likely to be an A or an I, okay? And so by frequency analysis, um, they were able to crack the substitution cipher after a thousand years of resisting cracking. Now, this wasn't known to everybody, but it was known to a few people in England, and it had a rather tragic consequence for someone. And this is from Simon Singh's fascinating book called The Code Book. And that was the case of Mary, Queen of Scots. Now, Mary, Queen of Scots was, of course, leading the Catholic rebellion to Queen Elizabeth. And she was imprisoned. And there was strong pressure on Elizabeth to execute her. But Elizabeth, because Mary was her cousin, didn't want to do so unless there was actual proof of treason. Now, Elizabeth's counselor, Walsingham, was a sort of, he was a spy master of his time. He was, and he had lots of people who, who knew people in Spain and who knew about Arabic cryptography. And he knew that it was possible to crack the substitution cipher. And as a result, Mary's communications with her supporters, uh, which were written in code, were actually cracked. And it was very clear that she gave her approval to people to mount a resistance against Elizabeth. And that effectively sealed her fate, and she was executed. So this is a, a case where being aware of that science and mathematics that goes on somewhere else had a, a, a major historical consequence. So <clears throat> we had the Islamic migration, but then of course there was also a, a different sort of 
uh, migration, which was colonization. And this particular thing, uh, graph shows the, uh, a map shows the uh, British Empire uh, in the, I believe in the late 1800s. And uh, it reminds me of this movie I saw, which is Land of Hope and Glory, where the teacher explains World War II to uh, a bunch of school children. And she points to a world map and she says, what do you see there? Do you see these pink bits? And, and the school child says, yes. And he says, do you know what these pink bits are? And, and the school child says, yes, those are ours. And people are trying to take them away from us. <laughs> so that's one view of the uh, British Empire. But colonization also spread European science and mathematics because by that time, uh, it, it's fair to say that the most advanced mathematics and science was done in Europe as a result of the Enlightenment and its uh, consequences. And so European science and mathematics was spread throughout the colonies. It also spread plants, for example, Vanilla, cocoa, and coffee were uh, spread from South America to uh, places like Africa, uh, often via Kew Gardens. And uh, pests like lantana were transported from South America to places like India and Australia. And of course, you've heard of migration and disease. So disease was also spread a great deal as a result of uh, colonization. But it had... Uh, one interesting thing, and that is that Indian mathematics by the 1800s was really not at the level uh, of uh, Western mathematics by that time. And so early in the colonial period, Indians would often go to Britain uh, for further studies. There was nowhere in India for them to be educated. And one of these... Uh, Ardhasir Kursaji Wadia was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1841. He was a shipbuilder and engineer. But of course, you know, in those days, uh, being an FRS meant you had friends of the right sort. That's what the letters stood for. And, <laughs> and he, some people might actually say that's true today, but, it's a, but I can assure you as president, it's, it's, it's not true. We, there's a very rigorous process. But Anyway, he was a wealthy Indian of the right sort. He was a, came from a highly anglicized uh, Parsi family. But for the next 77 years, no Indians were elected uh, to the Royal Society, partly because there were no institutions of higher learning in India. And, um, you know, very few Indians could afford to go to uh, England or, or, or to Britain to study. But in 1882, uh, four universities and 67 associated colleges were established uh, in India. And so it became possible for Indians to acquire uh, higher education uh, by the late 1800s. Now, in my office uh, at the Royal Society, uh, I have this bust. This is a bust of a famous Indian mathematician named Srinivasa Ramanujan, about whom there's a, there's a film recently made called The Man Who Knew Infinity, uh, which stars Jeremy Irons as G.H. Uh, Hardy, the Trinity mathematician, and Dave Patel as uh, Ramanujan. Now, Ramanujan was born in uh, this town here called Kumbakonam in South India, and then he spent quite a bit of his adult life in Madra working in Madras uh, when he grew up. Now, he was a self-taught mathematical genius. I'll, I'll come in the next slide, I'll show you how he taught himself. It's a very unlikely uh, way of teaching yourself. And there's a leg the legendary story is how he wrote some of his findings to G.H. Hardy uh, at Trinity College while he was working as a clerk in the port of Madras. And I won't belabor you with the story of uh, Ramanujan because you can either watch the movie or you can read the book, uh, better still, which is The Man Who Knew Infinity. It's the same title. And he 
became the first fellow of the Royal Society at the age of 31 uh, since Karsuchi, so 77 years after Karsuchi became a fellow. And we're celebrating his centenary this year, and there's going to be uh, a meeting uh, to celebrate the centenary, which will celebrate areas of mathematics that Ramanujan opened up. Uh, and in fact, his notebooks are still being used by mathematicians. Many of them have received tenure simply for proving results from uh, his note notebooks. And you know, this just shows you a number of posted stamps in India. In India, he's an absolute legend. And these are posted stamps issued uh, in his uh, honor. And you can see, uh, this, is, this is a posted stamp when I was a child, and this is like having, this is 15, the equivalent of 15p, if you like, and this is like four pounds and five pounds. So it shows you something about inflation in postage as well. Now, what Ramanujan did was teach himself uh, more advanced mathematics by this book by Carr called Elementary Results uh, in Pure Mathematics. And uh, in those days, if you wrote, if you said something if a textbook said elementary results, you almost automatically knew it wasn't. But uh, the funny thing is, this book is simply a collection of results, of lots and lots of theorems. And it was a very haphazard way. Nobody would actually teach mathematics that way. But that's what he found, probably acquired a copy of this book and then uh, started proving one result after another and then expanding on them. And uh, it's one of the ways in which he uh, taught mathematics. But the result of Ramanujan going to Cambridge, he died very young, uh, uh, he died only a, a, a couple of, a few years after he was in Cam arrived in Cambridge because he caught tuberculosis. And, uh, but nevertheless, the fact that he could go to Cambridge and become uh, a fellow of Trinity College and a fellow of the Royal Society uh, gave Indians enormous self-confidence because two centuries of colonization uh, had sort of almost inculcated in uh, Indians a feeling that they were somehow inferior uh, to Westerners. And unlike Karsuchi, who was a very anglicized and wealthy uh, Parsi, Ramanujan was neither uh, anglicized nor wealthy. Uh, his English was very, you know, uh, had a strong uh, Indian accent and, uh, and manner. And uh, he came from a very ordinary family, and, you know, in fact, a, a fairly poor family, and yet got the highest recognition. And so this really spurred on Indians uh, to uh, think about, to become very ambitious uh, in doing science. And many of them, like Raman, who went on to win the Nobel Prize for Raman spectroscopy, or J.C. Bose, who co-invented uh, radio, uh, I should say, and S.N. Bose, after whom bosons are named, or Saha, who was an astrophysicist, um, and Baba, who was a nuclear physicist. All of these people uh, went on to do uh, very good science, and uh, many of them were elected, to, all of these were elected to the Royal Society. Now, I wanted to talk about two Indians, and the second Indian is the person who actually donated this bust to the Royal Society. And that's an astrophysicist named Chandrasekhar, uh, who is shown here in this photograph. And Chandrasekhar was actually a nephew of, of C.V. Raman. Uh, and Raman, of course, was to date India's only completely homegrown uh, science Nobel Prize winner in the sense that uh, he not only did all, he did all his work in India, and his entire career was in India. But Chandrasekhar was e educated at Presidency College, one of the four uh, universities uh, that uh, the British founded in the late 1800s. And he wrote his first paper at the age of 19 and uh, was awarded a, a fellowship to Trinity College. So he set off for Cambridge. So that was his first migration. And in those days, it took a few weeks to arrive uh, in England because you uh, had to take a, a, a boat. And during that long journey, uh, he was 
continued to do physics, and he figured out that if stars had, had a mass that was larger than a certain limit, the force of gravity would be so strong that it would overcome any hydrostatic pressure, and they would collapse on themselves. And the limit, that mass limit, is now known as the Chandrasekhar limit. And it's the basis of this, this idea of collapse is the basis of black holes, which were discovered about 40 years later. <coughs> but when he arrived in Cambridge, he uh, you know, touted this theory to his colleagues. And many of them thought it was a, a brilliant idea. But one of them uh, was very strongly, almost vitriolically opposed to it. And unfortunately for Chandrasekhar, that man was the most powerful and famous astrophysicist uh, of his time, uh, was Arthur Eddington, after whom a village is going to be named in Cambridge uh, pretty soon. So Eddington did something that was rather underhand. He invited Chandrasekhar to present his findings at the meeting of the Astronomical Society in London. And during the weeks that led up to this lecture, he would constantly ask Chandrasekhar about his ideas. What he didn't tell Chandrasekhar was that he himself was going to follow uh, Chandrasekhar uh, after, and give his own lecture. And after Chandrasekhar spoke, he completely trashed uh, his result and said it was some mathematical uh, anomaly and had no relationship whatsoever to physical reality and it was an impossibility. And uh, this really um, pretty much uh, shattered Chandrasekhar. He went on to do good work and he actually took Trinity's credit despite this animosity with Eddington. They gave him a, 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 a prize fellowship which is uh, the equivalent of a junior research fellowship and then they recognized uh, that he was really brilliant and they were quite happy to keep him on. But he somehow felt that if he stayed on in England, he would always be working under Eddington's shadow. And so he decided to migrate again. And so he went from uh, England, uh, from Cambridge, to the University of Chicago. But he didn't actually work at the University of Chicago for a very long time. His first many years were actually at this observatory, the Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin, uh, which is about a two hour drive from the University of Chicago. So part of the reason for that is that even though he was increasingly being recognized as was one of the most brilliant astrophysicists of his time, the head of the department in the University of Chicago said that he couldn't possibly have a black man uh, to work on their, teach on their main campus. And so he, you know, he said, we can give him a job, but he has to work in the observatory where nobody will see him, you know, so we don't have to deal with him. Now, you know, we do talk about racism everywhere, but you have to realize this is at a time when Trinity was quite happy to give him a fellowship, okay? And it was sort, sort of unfortunate that he had to leave. But anyway, he went on to do very well. He used to drive once a week to teach two students, uh, you know, advanced physics, two graduate students, and uh, their, their names were Yang and Li, and he had, so effectively he could say that 100% of his students went on to win the Nobel Prize <laughs> because they, uh, they received it for showing that parity was not conserved. But he did, uh, he became, very well known. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1944, only seven years after he arrived in Chicago. But he had a rather long wait for the Nobel Prize. And part of it is the Nobel Prizes are not awarded unless there's experimental verification of your theory. So it took about 40 years to verify that black holes were real. And then he was awarded the Nobel Prize for 50 years, 50 years after uh, the work he did uh, when he was 19 or, or, or 20 years old. So that's sort of a, a second story about migration. So a group that has contributed enormously to 
all sorts of intellectual pursuits, including science, but also to uh, music and, and uh, literature, uh, are of course the Jews. And you could say that Jews are actually among the most migratory of all because uh, they originated uh, in what is today Israel and what was called Palestine. And most of them during the diaspora were dispersed uh, all over. Many of them uh, ended up in Middle Eastern countries and many of them went on to Europe. And then there was a second wave of migration where Jews went from Europe to uh, the United States, which I'll come to in a minute. Now, the first migration happened uh, after the Romans took over in about 70 AD. And uh, when they arrived in Europe, there was a kind of cyclic reception. There would be acceptance followed by rejection. There'd be these waves of acceptance and rejection. For example, uh, they were accepted initially in England, and then they were expelled in 1290 uh, by an edict by Edward I. And they actually, from England, many of them went to Spain, because at that time, Spain was under uh, Islamic rule, and there they were actually uh, tolerated and even actually welcomed in some quarters. And they didn't officially return to England until the uh, mid to late 1600s, starting from with Cromwell and then with uh, Charles II. So one of the ironies is that there were no Jews in England at the time of Shakespeare, and hadn't been Jews for centuries uh, at the time of Shakespeare. Uh, and so his Merchant of Venice is entirely based on sort of hearsay. He had no personal knowledge of, you know, a Jewish community in, uh, in England. And as I pointed out, they flourished for some time in Islamic countries, but of course, you know, Spain under the Moors was reconquered, and then the Inquisition was instituted, and Jews were expelled along with Muslims uh, from Spain. And what we call Sephardic Jews uh, it comes from the word Sephard, which means Spain. And so many of them actually uh, went back to the Middle East or to Turkey and uh, other parts of uh, the Islamic world. And even those who were in Europe uh, were often confined to ghettos in many uh, European countries. And they were unable to hold posts like c civil service posts or university uh, you know, academic posts and so on. And so many of them flourished as sort of mid-level um, you know, business people, shopkeepers and uh, people like that. However, starting with the French Revolution, uh, there was a, a movement towards the emancipation of Jews in Europe. So for example, uh, in France led the way by giving legal equality to Jews in 1791. Although I should say, even prior to their emancipation, uh, in other countries, uh, many Jews who had converted to Christianity uh, did flourish. For example, Benjamin Disraeli was a very famous Victorian uh, prime minister. Uh, of course, he had converted uh, to Christianity. And in Britain, the formal e equality of Jews, uh, that is to say the legal equality, uh, only happened in 1858. But even so, uh, there was still persistent anti-Semitism. There, there were pogroms in Eastern Europe, but there was also, um, even in Western Europe, like in France, there was the Dreyfus Affair, which we now know to be uh, anti-Semitic. But nevertheless, the emancipation, legal emancipation of Jews meant that they could go to universities, they could hold civil service jobs, etc., And that led to a huge flourishing of the intellectual contribution of Jews to because they then assimilated into the general intellectual lives, lives of the countries in which they resided. And of course, we, we know of people like Einstein and Fritz Haber and, other, and, and a huge number of others uh, who contributed hugely uh, to European science. But then, of course, there was the 1930s and the growth of fascism, which led to a second migration. And uh, for those who were lucky enough. And one of those who was lucky enough was Lisa Meitner, uh, who was one of the 
people who explain nuclear fission, and she is one of the women, uh, she's a classic example of women who should have got the Nobel Prize but didn't, and possibly the most important uh, of, the, of the women who should have uh, got the Nobel Prize. And actually her escape from Germany, she was an Austrian citizen who uh, was left without a passport when Austria was taken over by Germany. And then her, her sort of movement through Germany into Scandinavia uh, is quite a hair-raising story. Now, when this happened, it was clear that, you know, Jews were in, in real jeopardy uh, in uh, Nazi parts of Europe. And there was an academic assistance council set up by people like Sir Henry Dale uh, in 1933. And uh, to quote Max Perutz, it was a charity not run by British Jews for German Jews, but rather by British scholars imbued with the value of the individual regardless of nationality, race, or creed. And it was a remarkable decision by the British academic community to mount this totally selfless and quiet rescue operation. And as a result, many people, uh, for example, Hans Krebs and Ernest Chain and many others were uh, able to come to Britain uh, and escape the Nazis. Uh, Max himself was able to bring his uh, parents over. He was already here uh, at the time. And uh, what's not mentioned here is the famous physicist Max Born, who spent his entire wartime years in Britain, but then went back to Germany. And I, I should say that of the 74 displaced scholars had become fellows of the Royal Society Six became foreign members, 16 were Nobel laureates, and 18 were knighted. So again, it, they were hugely successful and contri contributed hugely to the uh, scientific life uh, of Britain. And they also did that to the United States. So Jewish migration to the United States occurred in two waves. The first wave was in the late 19th century, partly as a result of anti-Semitic pogroms and others in things in, in Eastern Europe. But then a second wave following the rise of Nazi Germany. And that included many scientists like Einstein and Bethe and, and Edward Teller and uh, Johann von Neumann and many others. And many prominent scientists in the United States today uh, are Jewish. And 22.5% of all Nobel Prize winners are Jewish. And compared to 0.2% of the world's population. And most of these are US immigrants or children of immigrants. So in the final part of the talk, I'll briefly talk about my own migration. I was born in South India. India is almost like, uh, I, I call it IU. It's no, officially known as the Indian Union, sort of like the European Union. Uh, it, it used to be a bunch of different kingdoms with their different languages, so essentially different nations, but was unified as a result of colonization. And when, my, when I was three years old, my parents moved to Gujarat, which is where all the Patels uh, in, in Britain come, originate from. And it was like going to a foreign country. My earliest memory is of st standing by a playground and not knowing what any of the other children uh, were saying. And I studied in, in Baroda until I was um, 19. And then I decided to uh, go to graduate school in the United States, which is, by, by my generation, uh, that was the default destination if you wanted to uh, go abroad. And so I moved to Ohio uh, at the age of 19 uh, to study at Ohio University. And this is where I was uh, trying to get a PhD in physics. But as I was getting my PhD in physics, I realized that physics was actually very hard. <laughs> okay. And um, I also realized that there had been very few, what I would call fundamental breakthroughs in uh, the last several decades. And it, it, it is still a, a very hard uh, subject. And I knew that if I continued in physics, 
I would spend the le rest of my life doing boring calculations that would get me publications, but that wouldn't actually improve understanding. Okay. On the other hand, there was biology, and I used to subscribe to scientific, well, I still do subscribe to Scientific American, and almost every issue of Scientific American reported major breakthroughs in biology. And I knew that many physicists had made that transition. Uh, for example, Max Delbrook or Max Perutz or Francis Crick uh, and others. So I knew that it, it was possible to do that. And I thought of doing a postdoc in uh, biology, but I felt I didn't know enough biology. So uh, I needed to acquire that background first. And so uh, I ended up uh, going to graduate school after I got a PhD in physics. So it was almost like going backwards, uh, you know, in order to change fields. And I went to the University of California in San Diego, which is in the sub a suburb called La Jolla. And after two years, I felt I had acquired enough biological background to, um, and this was the biology department, but I felt I'd acquired enough of a biology background and thought I was ready to do a postdoc. And I came across an article uh, to study something called the ribosome, but using a physical technique called neutron scattering. And so I wrote to the authors of the article, and uh, one of them, Peter Moore, uh, offered me a postdoctoral fellowship. And he worked at Yale, so we ended up crisscrossing all over again. And, you know, this is with uh, two young children in, in tow. So I have to acknowledge the fact that I had a very supportive wife who was rather tolerant of these, uh, you know, sort of frequent moves. And um, this is the person I uh, ended up working for who introduced me to this molecule called the ribosome, and that's uh, Peter Moore. Now, the ribosome is related to the problem of proteins and how proteins are made. So proteins are long chains of amino acids. You can, there are about 20 types of amino acids. And this is just showing how you can represent them as a string of letters, uh, each letter denoting one of these amino acids. But the point is these chains can fold up into different shapes. So this long filamentous shape is collagen, which is what makes up our skin and connective tissues. This is hemoglobin, uh, which was Max Perutz's protein, which carries oxygen from our lungs to in, in our blood to, to our tissue. And this is rhodopsin, which sits in the membranes of our cell, of the cells in our eyes, and senses light. It's a, it's a, very, it's a superb light detector. So the point is that proteins there are thousands of them, and they carry out all of the thousands of functions uh, in our cells. And so they're really what make us us, if you, like, if, if you can think of it that way. And the way that proteins are made is uh, they're made using information in our genes, which are simply stretches of DNA. And those stretches are copied into a molecule called RNA. And the RNA is then read by these adapter molecules which recognize groups of three bases in the RNA and bring along an amino acid. And somehow these amino acids are then connected up. Now, this doesn't happen by itself, but actually cell biologists realized that all of these proteins are made in these particles. Initially, they've located them on an organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum. And when they purified them, they realized that these part particles could be isolated. They were all consisted of two halves, and they were um, you know, present in all species. And they were given the name ribosomes. But they were enormous by molecular standards. They were big molecular complexes with 50 proteins and large pieces of RNA, almost a million atoms. And understanding them uh, was to take a huge uh, amount of time and involved a lot of work by biochemists and then eventually by structural biologists. And the way that works is the ribosome 
somehow figures out where to start on the genetic message. And it has slots for the binding of those adapter molecules, which bring the amino acids. And when the first one is bound, the second adapter, tRNA, can come in with its amino acid. And the ribosome can somehow link up the first and second. And then it moves along, and a third one comes in, and then it can link two and three. And so what you see is it's reading the genetic code, and according to the instructions specified by the code, it's only allowing the correct tRNAs to bring in the correct amino acids to stitch together a protein. Now, understanding all of this uh, was a huge problem. And I was tackling this with you know, neutron scattering, which actually turns out to be not that useful in biology, I'm sorry to say, uh, to any neutron scatterers here. And um, I was working on it at Brookhaven National Lab, and when they gave me tenure, they said, well, what will you do if, you give me t uh, if we give you tenure? I said, well, the first thing I'll do is stop whatever I'm doing and go away on sabbatical. And, and it was a, an odd answer, but luckily uh, they, they, sort of, they bought it and let me do it. And so I came here to Cambridge uh, to the LMB in 1991 and 92 because I'd written to Aaron Klug, uh, who was a director uh, of the lab at the time. And I came here to learn uh, crystallography, which could give you uh, the structure of uh, macromolecules in atomic detail. When I went back to Brookhaven, the lab had changed. and. Uh, because it was run by the Department of Energy, which only liked to support big projects like synchrotrons and reactors and so on. So they weren't keen on supporting individual investigators. And so I, I decided to move to the University of Utah, which apart from its spectacular geography, uh, was, had a, a, a fine reputation in genetics and biology in general. And it's the only time in my life that I've been a professor was in those uh, three and a half years. And so that involved, again, you know, packing up and uh, moving almost all the way across the country uh, to Utah. But when I got to Utah, I decided I wanted to work on the whole ribosome. And I didn't have any idea how long it would take because a group in Germany uh, led by Ara Jonat had been working on it for almost 20 years by that time, and hadn't really been able to uh, make a breakthrough. And I realized this is the sort of thing where I would need stable funding, because if you're on grants and at the end of three or four years you haven't cracked the problem, they're not going to renew your grant, and, and then you'll be out of luck. And I also needed uh, expert crystallographic colleagues, because you know I had just learned crystallography, and this was one of the toughest problems in the field. And I thought, well, you know, what if I run into problems? Maybe it would be nice to have colleagues who could hold my hand. And I noticed one of them is in the audience. Although I don't think I required his hand holding too much, in fact. Anyway, um, so I, and the other thing about the LMB is it was an institution with a long tradition of tackling hard problems in molecular biology. And the emphasis was more on the importance of problems and not on how f many papers you churned out and so on. And that's part of the reason uh, for its success. And, you know, Fred Sanger, when I look, at, look him up on, uh, you know, uh, uh, libraries of science, uh, his, I think I can only find about 40 papers and he has an H index of 18, which wouldn't get him tenure in most universities, <laughs> but it was enough to get him two Nobel Prizes. Anyway. And another thing about the LMB, I should say, is it, it's a place where Nobel laureates aren't considered any more special uh, than others who've done important work. And so uh, that's a, a very refreshing attitude. So, of course, um, this involved moving yet again from uh, Utah to Cambridge. And uh, people joked that I may have found my final resting place. Anyway, the gamble paid off. And we solved first the small subunit, and then it's complex with many antibiotics. And then a few years later, the structure of the entire ribosome. This is about a million atoms uh, with uh, you know, the 
fleshy RNAs and, and the piece of the genetic message in place. And as a result of the structural work and lots of biochemical work by uh, you know, people over many decades, we sort of understand how the ribosome you know, roughly works. So the small subunit figures out where to start on the genetic message, which was that long first amino acid. And then what happens is the next tRNA comes in and it's brought in by a, a, a protein factor. And uh, it then, if it happens to be the correct tRNA, uh, which matches up with the codon, then it's accepted and, and then swings into the place and then its amino acid is joined up with the first one. So the first and second amino acids are joined up by the ribosome. And then the whole thing has to move. So the tRNAs move first with respect to the large subunit, and then another protein helps them, helps the tRNAs move with respect to the small subunit. And this sort of cycle keeps on going, and tRNAs come in and out of the ribosome. And I'm going to show it to you at about five times uh, slower, uh, you know, a five times slower rate so that you can see it happening, otherwise it would all just be a, a blur. So you can see the tRNAs coming in and the ribosome and eventually it reaches the end of the gene and there's a special codon which tells the ribosome that this is the end of the signal and you must stop now. And when that happens, a special protein called a a termination factor or a release factor uh, binds to the ribosome and then cleaves off that newly made protein so that it can go off and do its thing. And uh, then two other proteins bind the ribosome and split it apart so that the whole process uh, can start all over again. And while you've been listening to me, tens of thousands of ribosomes in all your cells have been churning out you know, thousands and thousands of copies of all sorts of proteins uh, as we speak. So it led to some interesting consequences. One of these is, you know, <laughs> people know how fond I am of black tie and, you know, formal uh, dress. And, and so uh, this is a picture that appeared uh, the day after in all the Swedish newspapers. And I was very gratified that the Swedish press had learned the importance of ribosomes although I suspect there were other reasons why the uh, photograph appeared. Now, in my last two slides, I want to just talk a bit about science today. Today in the UK, 30% of researchers are immigrants, and about half of those are from the EU. And they're often vastly overrepresented in the sort of highest echelons of science. For example, in the US, uh, about 25% of National Academy members are immigrants. Many more are children of immigrants, but, but we don't have a way to uh, you know, cat, uh, cat, catalog them since those records are not kept. And a similar no number are Nobel laureates. So the question is, why is migration important in science? So first of all, it allows the exchange of new ideas and expertise and new ways of doing things. So if you're aware of what's going on elsewhere and you have people who come from elsewhere, they bring in new ideas, new ways of uh, even thinking about problems. Another is that, you know, immigrants uh, often tend to overachieve, but there are many reasons for that. Firstly, they could be pre-selected, you know, because in order to be selected, you know, they have to be somehow better than average, you know, to, to even come to a place like Cambridge or, um, you know, Harvard or somewhere. And another thing is they're insecure when they go somewhere, and so they're often anxious and eager to prove themselves. And so this combination uh, may uh, account for the fact that they're so overrepresented in, in these things. Now, in the past, Britain has thrived because it has been uh, quite an open and tolerant society, as you saw from that uh, council to uh, help refugees from Europe. And so I think it's quite important to maintain our ability to recruit internationally, because to be the best, we really do need to recruit uh, from the best. <laughs>
And one of the things that, you know, Peter Lilly, who's a very hard right uh, Brexit supporting politician from, I believe, uh, Hitchin. Uh, I know it's one of the train stations on the way to Cambridge. Uh, anyway, he was at a, a talk on immigration and he launched into a tirade about how we were avoiding the problem by importing brains when we should be training young uh, people here. And my, I tried to, t I pointed out, I think somewhat successfully, although I, you can never tell, um, that actually by providing the best international environment, you're actually making things better for uh, homegrown talent as well, because you're putting them in the best possible environment worldwide. Uh, and, and so you're actually improving opportunities even for homegrown talent. So it's not an either or thing. And finally, it's not a one way street. I always encourage young British scientists to go abroad, uh, especially to the United States or, and so on, to, to broaden their experience and minds and also to learn uh, new ways of doing things. So thank you very much for listening to me and also for showing up today. amazing video. For a physical scientist, it's just incredible to, to see what, what uh, you know, biologists are able to, to figure out. Thank you very much indeed, Benki. I mean, I'm not going to survey the audience right now, but I suspect that if I did survey all of you uh, academics or students sitting out here in this hall tonight, most of us will be, or will have been, uh, on some sort of migration pathway, whether from one university to another or across continents. Um, you know, as Venki has said, seeking discovery is part of this global community of, of researchers. And I think, as you've tried to say, the, res the consequences, the results of all of this um, are for, for all mankind, that they're not restricted to one university or, or one small group of people. And indeed, that's what the Apollo plaques uh, left on the moon say. It's for all mankind. Knowledge is for all of humanity, and we are all engaged in, in a, a common enterprise, even though day by day and week by week, it, it's all at the very personal and uh, sm small group of people level. So thank you. So I turn to next week. Next week's lecture is, is the last of this year's series, and that's on animal migration. And in that, Professor Ian Cousin, director of the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology, will talk about collective animal behavior, and particularly the migration of birds and insects. So I hope to see you all then. But finally, to end tonight, we please again thank Venki Ramakrishnan for his fascinating lecture.